because like that's starting off with yeah, a lie. Yeah, yeah. It's a lie, right? So the best thing about sales is you never have to lie to anyone. You never have to. You just tell them the truth and you get to be the person who tells them the truth. Hey, your breath sucks. You should probably do something to fix it. Selling. It's part and parcel of business. You can't avoid it. And for that reason, over many, many decades, perhaps a hundred years or more, people have been teaching other people how to be better at selling. Some of those strategies have held strong. They still work to this day, decades and decades later. But some of those strategies sometimes smell a little bit iffy. They're a little bit on the nose. They're a strong indication to future customers and clients that you have sales breath, that you might be a little bit desperate, which is why today we're going to be talking about sales. And I'm going to be talking with the sales sniper himself, Matt Ryder. He is the founder of Sales Sniper. He's also the CEO of Sniper Media uh, and Seventh Level, which is a sales training company. And as an interesting aside, the reason why he gets this name at Sales Sniper is because Matt used to be in a former life a sniper. Matt, how did that happen? And then how did you transition from that life to the one that you have right now? Uh, yeah, for sure. So I was in uh, uh, two commander regiments. So Australia is one of Australian special operations um, battalions or commands, whatever you want to call it. Uh, was in snipers, was in recon, then in snipers, and then from there I did a bunch of deployments. And then when I got out, um, went into personal training. And then from there I realized, you know, it was really a sales game. That's really all it was. And so then from there I ended up opening like a series of gyms. I sold them just before COVID and then opened up uh, like a fitness done for you sales agency. And then from there that kind of evolved into a like high ticket coaching and consulting kind of sales agency. Um, uh, and then from there kind of transitioned into more, um, you know, business ownership. So now we have a done for you sales company where we do like done for you sales management and selling. So like we just come in and take over selling. Um, we place our reps, do all our stuff. Then we have a sales management one where we come in and just put in all our systems processes. And then we use your people. Uh, and then we train them, hold them accountable, that kind of good stuff. And then we have a uh, done for you marketing component where we work with just a very small number of like boutique clients where we do paid media and all that kind of stuff. And then we have a sales training organization as well called Seventh Level. So and a bit of it, like a sort of a sales ecosystem. A sales ecosystem. Yeah. So uh, it sounds like pretty much everything but recruitment. Yeah. Um, now, this is a, I mean, like for some people, this might seem like a, an unusual transition from being a sniper to a sales sniper. Are there any like skills or experiences that you had back then that have like assisted you in your current role right now? I think like the ability to like consume and track data is really important for anyone who wants to be any good at sales. Uh, whether it's like a, you know, whether you're in a business owner position and you have sales reps or whether you are a sales rep or whether you're the business owner who's doing the sales, if you don't really fundamentally understand like how to get the correct, how to really break down what you're doing into a process and then get a series of inputs, it's it's basically impossible to effectively problem solve what's going on. And from what I see, the reason why most businesses stay small um, is because they just don't know what they're looking at, you know, and like you can have all the fancy, you can have the best data collection in the world. Like it, it's sort of meaningless without the ability to interpret it correctly in the same way that having a phenomenal rifle is great. But if you don't know how to shoot it, like, there's just no point. Um, and so what I find is people like either over collect or under collect data. Then from there, they really don't have any, they don't really put in the effort, in my opinion, in order to like reasonably assess what's happening and take a systematic approach into fixing things. Like if you fish two things at once, how do you know it worked? Yeah. How do you know which one was the uh, So, you know, I see people throwing baby out with bathwater all the time and it's just because it's just impatience, you know? Mm. And I think that, um, you know, the ability to read data and interpret it correctly and then have the patience to be able to, to see your strategies develop over time. And, and make sure that you don't like get caught up in little stupid things is uh, is a big hold back. And why people are such bad sales managers as well. You know, they go, someone has a good month and they go to their sales rep and go, that's a new standard. Well done. It's like the stupidest thing you can say to somebody. 
right, let's we'll come we'll come down to some of the dumb dumb things in a in a minute. But that is a recurring theme that I hear. Uh, being able to track and measure and monitor the right data. I have a question for you. What do you think, who do you think is going to outperform? The salesperson with natural ability, but no systems, or the person with no natural ability, but rock solid systems to help them manage and track uh. their sales? I don't. I don't think it's a question that could be answered, to be honest, because I don't think there is like, I don't think natural ability in sales really has much bearing on someone's ability to sell. Um, like a natural proclivity to persuasion, I, you know, like I think they'll both get laydowns. So it really just depends on your percentage of laydown, right? Uh, a process is always better than no process. But in saying that, like I know tons of salespeople who are just lone wolves, who won't do any of their admin, and they'll just kill it. You know, yeah. but they have a process that they're following in their head. It's just not something that like we observe. You know, um, so it's just it's a, it's a difficult question to and like answer. I would say if they're equally matched in terms of skill, or like let's say there's a twenty percent, if you could even do that, if there's a twenty percent differential, like the person who's worse but has good systems and they have like follow up referrals, like they have a pipeline management system, like they're doing that kind of stuff. Uh, and they're doing their admin and they're like checking their data on a regular basis, like that person will over the long term probably outperform the person who doesn't do that, even if they are better at sales. I asked the question because we have a saying in our business, systems equal sanity, but also because I'm constantly trying to get it across to people that selling is not about, I don't know, chutzpah and flair and being able to dazzle and do cartwheels. And I wanted specifically to ask you the question, Matt, because Matt, is not doing cartwheels right now. Like, uh, Matt, sometimes you seem a little bit standoffish. Has anyone ever said that to you? Is that part of your sales approach? Has that benefited you? Do you think there's a sales type? Uh, like, I'm quite stoic when I sell. Like, I would maintain this when I sell. Like, when I was a salesman, I was a seven-figure earner. I averaged ninety dollars to $100,000 a month when I would, like, commission only when I was selling. And I wasn't selling expensive stuff. I was just selling like sort of standard coaching, consulting, ten to thirty thousand dollar packages. But I would sell, you know, sixty, seventy units a month, um, and I'd be quite consistent about that. Half the time, I'd try to generate my own leads um, through like the lead generation pools that they had. So I was a very systemized and very like good sales rep. Um, but I had a high level of skill. But I was also a full time sales rep for twelve years before that became a reality. You know, before that, the most I'd ever made was like eighty thousand dollars a year. Um, selling like fitness, but I was doing such high volume stuff for such a long time that by the time that I kind of got to selling more high ticket items, I had sort of gone through the iterations of, you know, uh, shit loads of bad leads, small amounts of good leads, no leads, too many leads. Like uh, I'd gone through purchasing the leads myself. So I had a different sort of level of respect for that. And then I'd run my own business. I'd run brick and mortar businesses. I'd run online businesses and I'd run a couple of different variants of online businesses. So by the time I kind of got to that end state, I had a, a good enough answer for everything that was put my way to where like I could be really, really consistent. And I had the systems and the processes uh, to where I would maximize every lead that I had. And I sort of took that upon myself. So like, which made me a very difficult salesperson to manage. Um, because I had a tremendous amount of leverage over the business owners and they would ask me to do stuff. And I'd say, unless you pay me, I'm not doing anything. Um, because if I make $2,000 an hour through selling your program, you have to pay me $2,000 an hour for me to do anything. Like I wouldn't train the team. I wouldn't do shit because I was really good at it. And so, um, as I started to like, sort of get better at that and get more consistent, I started to get asked by a lot more people to do, you know, uh, you know, Taylor Welch asked me to do their sales for them and a bunch of other people, Ryan Serhant and all these sort of like semi pseudo celebrities started coming out of the woodwork. And so I started training people underneath me and I was getting trained by a guy called Jeremy Miner and how to sell. And Jeremy as a straight commission on the earner was averaging about $3 million a year. Mm. So he was like three times better than I was um, just from a straight revenue standpoint. So I started learning his system, putting under him and then I, I became his sales rep. And then from there, he asked me to run the company. Because that's sort of where more of my skill set lies is more in like the running and like sort of growing of companies. And so like well, we're on the fastest growing company list for Australia and the US. Mm, so. 
Well, well, you've done your 10,000 hours, as they say. Yeah, yeah, well and truly. Like it's, and then some. Yeah, and then some. And it is and it is interesting when I asked you the question about what do you think it's the sales skill or it's, or it's, the, or it's the system. Uh, and then you've got to add mindset as well, too, because some people give up fairly quickly. But I think that with you and just talking to you, I think that you were developing your own systems in your head and then you started to take your systems out of your head and now you're running this fast growth um, international company. That's, uh, I think I heard uh, either earlier talking to you or somewhere else that it's signing up 400 to 500 clients in any given month. So it's yeah, a, so at seventh level, yes. we sign up a few hundred that business in Aussie. Oh, do you guys do Aussie or is this more in the American or what's the audience? It's everywhere. It's ah, so we do like maybe two and a half million a month over at that particular side of the business. And then all up, we probably do like 50 million a year, mm. something like that. Um, all the businesses were started around 2019, 2020. Um, so we're fairly diversified at this point. Like we're not super heavily leveraged in any one direction, but um, like all of them require like very good sales systems. And like what, 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 what we try and do is just take what we're good at. And then from there, like kind of bolt on things that are like low administration, high profit verticals and diagonals, you know? So, yeah, uh, which just makes the running of the business relatively simple. Like I'm on five meetings a week. And, and from what I've seen as well too, the offers are really, really simple. And I know I see this a lot. People could be the best salespeople in the world, but if the offer's all complicated and confusing and it's difficult hmm. to articulate and there's levels and they try and be too generous with too many bonuses. And by the end of it, the person's overwhelmed and confused. Yeah. The, the other thing that I see with the offers coming out of your business, they seem to be pretty straightforward. Yeah. We do your sales or we train your sales, how to teach your team how to do it. Or we treat you how to get better at sales. Like it's just a bit of a sales ecosystem. The only thing I don't do at the moment is placement just because I can't figure out ethically how to do it right now. Um, because if I have good guys, I might as well just take them myself. Like, yeah, you, 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 know. you, you go, I've got these people which are not good enough for us. So I'm going to give them to you. It doesn't really yeah, quite stack up. Exactly. So like, listen, there will become, there is a point and there is, there is becoming a point very soon where like we can't physically take on, like there's just not enough work for the reps that because we do take on so many reps at seventh level, like we sign up, you know, a good month might be 700 new clients, you mm -hmm. know, a bad month might be 300. So like um, th there's only so many people that we could take on, even if you're looking at, five the top five percent or the top two yeah. percent so you know um it, it's getting to a point where we probably can start to do something like that but i haven't got it slated for even consideration until the us q2 Stick to which is our q4 which is confusing Hi. enough as it is so let's talk about strategies that have kind of stopped working or they're on their way out or they're a little bit on the nose I saw yeah. you on uh, TikTok the other day talking about yes ladders. Now, I, I, I grew up learning about yes ladders. Can you explain yes what that stuff. is? Yeah, I just think like there's a lot of old sales tactics like the yes train where it's like ask nine questions that have an answer of yes and the 10th one will have an answer of yes again. Same as like option closing. Would you like the blue or the red, the black or the white, the six of them or three of them, 12 months, three months, you know what I mean? Like Visa or MasterCard. Right. I just think it's like, to be honest, I think that there are tactics that um, rely on the stupidity of the prospect. So it's like they're they're born from an era of like boiler room selling where like you're sort of like you can't trick people into buying stuff. <laughs> like so like the efficacy of those is like they're already sold and it's just it's working in spite of, you know, what I mean, it's like if you option close somebody, it's like they were going to buy. It's not like the option close did anything. So it just got the person who was already like, yeah, I'm in like, sweet, you know? Um, and it's, it, it is a path of least resistance. However, like you're pretending that they don't have another choice. Well, there, let's, there, there is another choice. It's a no. Well, we didn't actually say what either of these things are. So yeah. like, well, I the yes train. Yes so it's like nine the... yeses in a row. The 10th is a yes. Right. And then you've got the option close, which is like, would you like the red or the blue? Would you like 12 pack or six pack? Would you like to pay that over three months or six months? Would you like Visa or MasterCard? That's an option close. So all, but all those things, it's like you're pretending like there's not a third option. It's like, well, yeah. no, I don't like, yes, I would like all those things and no, I don't want to buy them. Like that's, that option is always there. And so like my thought, the same as like action taker discounts, I think they're disingenuous um, unless they're real. And if they are real, why? 
right? Like if you come at the beginning of a call and you tell me, hey, Matt, at the end of this call, I'm going to ask you to make a decision. It could be a yes or a no, but it, you know, I prefer not a maybe. And if you are, I'm going to give you an action taken discount of X, Y, Z, whatever. I will intentionally enter that call because I'm kind of an asshole is I will go, I'm interested in doing this. I will speak to you tomorrow at three o'clock. And, and if they give me the discount, I'll never move forward with them. Because like that's starting off with yeah, a lie. Yeah, yeah. It's a lie, right? So the best thing about sales is you never have to lie to anyone. You never have to. You just tell them the truth and you get to be the person who tells them the truth. Hey, your breath sucks. You should probably do something to fix it. And so when, when, when people, when salespeople put themselves in situations where they have to do disingenuous bullshit like that, I think it starts off their relationship with the client really poorly. And it, and it starts a downward spiral for the salesperson where they will eventually get sick of selling it and they'll leave. Um, like, so I just think, I just don't see the benefit of all those things. Like I, like I've been in sales long enough and I've been a successful enough salesperson to where I've never had to use any of those tactics even when they're available to me. I just like, I used to sell for like a high ticket fitness guy and their scripts. I just came in to fill in while their owner was away for like two months on a, on a honeymoon. And like, they were like, Hey, this is how we do it. I was like, perfect. I just did my own way and I outsold everybody. And I'll, and then now they now do it my way. Yeah. Um. So it's just like, uh, you know, it's the same as like a lot of the old tactics where like they tell people to to pull up uh to pull a problem in very quickly. So like probe, get a problem and then go deep on the problem quickly. Like that doesn't work. Um, because you haven't built enough rapport with the person to where like in the first two or three minutes of a call, like what they tell you is the problem is not the problem. Mm. That's like the surface level problem. And then you start attaching all of these like solution and consequences, both positive and negative to a problem that isn't the real problem. Um, and people who haven't sold that much, like that's the kind of path they fall into. And a lot of the sales trainers, unfortunately, are, you know, people who sold one thing once, did half decent at it. You know, one of the biggest sales trainers that I know, like his best month as a sales rep was 30 grand as commissions. I was like, fuck me, I was doing that a week. Yeah, you know, I've read a lot of books. You know, and, and so, uh, and, and also, if you've only ever sold time. one offer, it's really difficult. Like, you know, you have to sell multiple niches to multiple people, different demographics, B2B, B2C. Like, there's not a huge difference between B2B and B2C, and depending on how you classify B2B. Like, if you classify B2B as like enterprise, like if you're selling to a business owner, that's a B2C sale, as far as I'm concerned. Like, I would treat it the exact same. If I'm selling to the business owner of a multinational with like where I have to work my way up to the owner, that's a like a business to enterprise or business to business sale. But if I'm talking direct to the owner, like I might as well just be selling anyone. It makes it makes no difference uh, to me. Um, you know, and so like when we do our like more business to business programs at seventh level where we come in and train an entire team, like we just did a keynote for like 6,000 employees of an insurance agency and now we're training all of their people, right? So we're doing it in lots of a thousand. We train them all at once. Um, like that sale took three months to, to close and we had to go through like six different layers of people. That's a real classic sort of business to business sale. Whereas like when I sell our done for you services, most of the time, I'm just talking direct to an owner like yourself. And I yeah. treat that the exact same as a B two B as a B two C sale. It's a complex B two C sale because there's B two C sales like you know like hiring a plumber, right? You choose yeah. a plumber, and it's like walking into a shop and paying something over the counter. But yeah. where they need to, you need to be able to demonstrate value up front. And I'll tell you the difference between like you know like a a, a complex B two C or a typical B two B where you are selling to the owner. It's one of the things is you're selling an outcome, which is a very different in a lot of other situations. You're not in a lot of situations, you're selling something that's physical, like it's this laptop and it's got 12 gigabytes of this and all the other stuff, you know, or it's a sandwich or a carton of milk, but you're selling an outcome. The other thing is that uh, in other situations, it's more, it's about the transaction. It's like how much money and all this other stuff. Whereas complex B2C or, or B2B is more about the trust. So the dollar price can go up, it can go up, it can go down, it can go all over the place because there's often no like fixed figures. But if the trust is high, 
because it's tied back to the outcome and there's a high value in the outcome. It's going to be a different thing. That's the main difference that I see when I talk about a B2B sale versus a typical B2C sale. Yeah. Yeah, no, fair enough. And there are complex, I mean, there's there's semi-complex B2C sales, you know, of course, like, you know, you're a mortgage broker. And every now and then you come across someone who's like a photographer, you know, and then it's a, it's got all the trappings of a B2B because they want the trust and the, yeah. there is no. I would say the most complex clients. B2C thing that we sell, we sell like a syndicated buying offer where it's like a seven figure deal price. So they're, they're buying a percentage of a business. Yeah. Um, that's probably the most complex thing. Those are, those are usually like three month sales cycles because yeah. they're seven figures. So lawyers have to get involved and stuff like that. But like, that's probably the most complex thing that we get involved in in terms of like, and that includes B2B as well. One of, one of the, one of the, the most complex B2B thing that we sell is a, um, a business called Catalyze Health that redoes uh, health insurance for Fortune 100s, for Fortune 1000, sorry. Um, so they redo the health insurance oh, comp yeah. plans and they take a percentage of the savings. Oh, that's cool. So um, that's like are- a full cold calling process though. So you have to cold call and it's a it's a very like, um, it's long, but it's like super fruitful. The commissions are, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands. So, you know, you close one deal a month and the sales rep's pretty happy. Yeah, because it's in insurance. Yeah, I just think the two. I just think two of the more complex ones. Uh, a B two. There was two ones that I just thought of. One was um, someone reached out and they needed us to. They wanted our help to sell three albino barracudas or some crap like that. And it was a three thousand. It was a three hundred thousand dollar fish. Yeah, and right. they somehow managed to catch three of these things, and they wanted our help. Uh, sometimes you got to turn down the, turn away the client. I, we had no idea how to help them try and yeah, sell that. Uh, and the, another one was, uh, which we did help with was someone came in and they wanted us to help them sell a, um, a, a nut and bolt combo, one nut and bolt combo for $250,000 because the nut and bolt combo was used in advanced manufacturing. Interesting thing. Hey, anyway, um, Matt, I saw, um, yeah, I saw someone comment on Facebook the other day and they said uh, the sales profession, uh, a lot of people in the sales profession don't want to have the title sales something. So they all have these different names. Um, Senior advisor and stuff like that. Senior advisor. um, I was wondering in terms of like things which put people on the nose, this person had all these other ideas. Maybe they should be a salesperson should be called a pathfinder or a guide or a Sherpa because their job is to help the prospect navigate all the different options to make the decisions. Fair enough. I mean, that just sounds like a personal, personal preference. Sort of, I guess the more woo woo you are, nothing against it. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm not very, um, uh, like I, it's probably how you want to run that. That would just be a business specific choice, right? Like, I mean, for me personally, if I hopped on a call and the guy was, you know, his email signature was Pathfinder. I'm just like, oh, what an interesting way to say sales guy. Yeah. Like, you know, for me, like my my moniker forever was sales guy. Like that's what I used on all my email signatures. Matt, sales guy, high five. Whenever people ask me, like, do you use the product? I'll be like, no, like, why not? I'm like, because I'm the sales guy. Yeah. Like, that's not my job. Uh, like for me at my companies, like we we call them um uh what do we call them at seventh level? I think we call them um, uh, account executive. Account executive. It's pretty common. Yeah. You said advisor before. I, I do like advisor. We have specialists and they might be specialists yeah. in a specific field. And that is yeah. because we don't put them on the call to sell something. We put them on the call to solve a problem. And then if they are able to solve that problem on the call, it usually, yeah. you know, it's, it's we've delivered value up front. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, you know, anything that you can do, like in order to, to mitigate somebody no showing, like that's really all it is. Like, you know, you could, you can, you know, sort of try 20 different names, you know, give it 15, 20 calls each. If the show up rate changes, depending on what it is, then like change it to, to sort of benefit. I don't think it really makes a difference. It's just sort of like what stops people from turning up because like the lowest performing, the lowest hanging fruit for any business is show up rate. That's usually the first thing whenever I come in, I try and fix Uh you know, I did the data for quite a big business from a very large influencer over in the US and I am coming and I'm revamping their sales at the moment and they gave me their data. And first first things first, they're like, what are you going to do with the team? I was like, well, I'm not going to talk to the team for the first two weeks because like, I don't need to, to make you more money. All I have to do is go in there and basing on this data, there's like three things that I have to fix. I know like 20 different ways to fix those three things, but like I can only try one at a time. So like based off your call volume, I can try one every three days. 
you know, because I need I need a I need at least sixty or seventy calls to go by before I can tell if it's actually had a positive result. So like I don't need to speak to them for two weeks. I'll just fix the show up rate to triage because they're running a two call close, um, which for their demographic and their offer makes sense. Um, and then from there, they have a low show up rate to sales calls. So like I can fix those through process. I don't have to fix them through skill. So um, like a lot of people, like anything that puts people off, you want to get rid of straight away and string things back to the bare bones. Uh, like a lot of people have like, they over communicate to sit to, to prospects. Uh, one, one of the key things that I find when it comes to like uh, just dialing up sales automatically, have a look at like opt in for your own funnels. Sometimes people forget to untag people in like marketing sequences. So if you have, if you have like marketing emails that go out and let's say they're on a retargeting list and then they opt in, they're getting retargeted, they're getting the marketing emails and they're getting the opt-in emails. And then your sales reps might be doing individual reach outs as well. The worst I've ever seen was 19 emails in two days. So because like you should be untagged from every promotional list the moment you have a call booking and then that call booking, the outcome should then retag them if necessary or keep them off or put them onto new lists, right? That should just be done automatically through your CRM. So like if you're not doing that, then you're probably creating a lot of hassle for yourself, but also you're going to be inducing no-shows. And then just having a look like, is there, is like, are they doing text reminders? If not, why not? Are the email reminders going out? Are they personalized? Do they sound stupid? Um, yeah, there's a lot so of different things that can happen. If we're, if we're talking about sales strategies that give sales that indicate that suggest that you got sales breath. Sales breath often means that you sound a little bit desperate. Yeah, like commission uh, breath. Yeah. Yeah, commission breath. Uh so Matt's suggesting that sometimes over communicating is one of those put-offs. So I'm just gonna recap quickly some of the things that we don't want to do. Uh we very briefly talked about uh yes trains or yes ladders. Um you talk about option closing. I still am a fan of option closing, but we'll actually yeah. give them the third option, <laughs> which yeah. is you can do A, you've got this plan, this plan, or you can do nothing. Uh, yeah. But I, Listen, I don't think that they're bad. I just personally, I don't see the benefit, right? So they're all things like whatever works, do it. Like, I don't care, right? Like you can say whatever you want. If it works, I'm like high five, right? You can tell people like, you just go, hey, either do this or go die in a fire like you're dead to me. You know what I mean? Like if that's how you want to roll and it works for you, then go for it. No. Right? Whatever, 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 whatever puts money in your table, as long as what you're selling is good, right? If what you're selling is good, I have no problem with many methods of sale. Um, but I, for me, like as someone who is like a sales, I think of myself as like an expert in the area, but like I really enjoy like the academic pursuit of learning sales. Like I've learned a lot of different types of sales. I've studied it in depth. I consider myself fairly good at it. There are certain activities that if they work, people should do them. And everyone's individual in that. Like I'm not, I'm, I like any PQ as a methodology, which is what we teach. However, I'm, I am more team winning than I am team anything else. Well, um, let's just, um, let's just close off on, one or one or two things that don't work. And then let's talk about things that do work. So you also mentioned that action taker discounts is something that you do not like. Uh, Mostly because I think most of the time they're a lie. Yeah. Yeah. Anything that's a lie, any, any, any scarcity, yeah. you know, false yeah. scarcity, anything like that is, yeah. is, 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 is ridiculous. I'm going to give you the opportunity to share one more thing that gives you the shit. Uh, if there um, is one more thing, and then we'll just switch to some of the things that do work. Um, I think uh, I don't know. Not, not much of it gives me the shits. I think that like um, I think that like offers made is probably the thing in sales that probably shits me the most. What is but it? But that's very specific to an industry. Oh, the offers uh, that are made. Yeah, like an offers made metric. Like oh. if you track offers made close rate, I think oh, it's dumb. Right. Um, I just don't see the use for it. No, uh, I don't see what data can be gleaned from it. Because like you're asking someone to retrospectively tell us objectively why they didn't do their job. Mm. Because I guarantee you somebody could have sold them. Well, yeah. I mean, like they're just going to say, oh, this person was the wrong fit. or oh, this person didn't have the budget. or oh, this person was going on holiday, whatever it is for all the different reasons. Exactly. So like I didn't offer them, but I closed 60% of the people I offered. It's like, well, well done. You should close 100% of the people you offer. Like if you're, if you're only offering people who are, like good, you know what I mean? So 
Like there's no real insight that can be gleaned from a sales or marketing perspective from that data. All it does is just a metric to make salespeople feel good about themselves. And it's only in a very, it's only in the high ticket consulting industry. That is not a metric in any other business, any other industry. It is, it was, I think, I don't know who pioneered it, but I would love to have a chat with them because of just how stupid it is. No, it was a, it was a, it was a salesperson that was trying to demonstrate to their employer that they would, that doing a, a good job. Yeah. So they, and so it just, every it salesperson ever, yeah. they, they manipulated their metrics to make them look yeah. a little bit better. That's why they yeah, did it. That's all. And that's literally all it does. And so I think like, if you can do one, like remove that metric from your system, if you're using that and just go off everyone who turns up because like that will give you a more accurate representation of the quality of the salesperson, the quality, but also the quality of the lead. Like, because if your entire team is closing terribly, like you have to be willing to have a look at yourself and go, Ooh, is it the marketing? Like, I, I, I remember I came in once this guy, he's doing like a million dollars a month. He's doing pretty well. Um, and he wanted me to come in and fix his sales team because they're underperforming. And judging by the data, they were. So I came in, listened to a bunch of calls and then said, Hey man, you don't have a sales problem. You have a marketing problem. And he was like, no, I do the marketing. And I was like, that's fantastic. And I applaud you for that. However, your marketing sucks. Um, it's like your team is good. You have a good team. They are disciplined. They are doing all the right things. Their calls are quality. Your leads are comically terrible and you need to fix it. And he was like, no, you're wrong. I was like, okay. Um, it's like uh, Gordon Ramsay. It's yeah, like I, wish, I wish you all the best. <laughs> well, like there's just, you know, like they're, the leads were bad. The leads were like, and I don't say that very often as like a someone who comes in, like it, it would benefit me to tell him that the leads are good and the sales team bad because like he was offering me a 5% override, which straight off the bat is 50 grand a month. But I was like, I, like your sales team doesn't need fixing. Mm. It's your marketing needs fixing. And that's evident by the fact that like your, your, like your sales calls are all very good and your sales guys are very good, but the leads are bad. You need to have some like quality control metrics. Cause like, I think one thing that's been lost in recent times is MQL to SQL ratios. Like people just don't really talk about marketing qualified lead, sales qualified lead. And everyone's just in a habit of throwing everybody into a sales process without really nurturing them. Yeah. Um, and like in this day and age, like every prospect that you get is being marketed by six other identical offers. Like it's very difficult to have a unique offer these days. So there might be elements of your offer that are somewhat unique, but overall there is a competing product or service which have fulfilled the needs in a very similar way. Uh, so it's like how you separate yourself by, I mean, but yes, you need a point of difference within your, within your business. However, like you need to be able to nurture people and create trust outside of your sales process in order to get people through it. Like there's tons of sales trainers on the planet. I think that we're the best. Of course I do. But if you ask the other guy on a podcast next week, he thinks he's the best. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, about some of the, let's talk yeah. about some of the to do's. Because before, when you talked about measuring offers made, I, that's not something that we measure in our business. You know, we yeah. actually do the MQLs and the SQLs and the whole bit, but we don't measure fantastic. offers made. But um, when you said it, I was thinking about the to do's. And I was like thinking um, one of the to do's that we encounter again and again. And if people just fix this simple thing, their lives would be so much better. And that is the actual offer itself. Yeah. People um, like, um, that's why like in, like in coaching, you see a lot of businesses will die after like two years. Um, most of the time it's because they're not constantly evolving their offer. So like, I'll give you an example. At seventh level, every quarter we release a new product, right? Um, so every quarter there's a new product and every year, one of our core products is completely revamped, right? Because there's evolution of sales and we get to the more clients that we train, the more data we collect from them, the, the better the better uh, training we can provide. And so uh, it's an, it's an ongoing process for us to revamp that. Um, and then from there, like we have a, a we use the, the product, the individual products that we release on a quarterly basis. We use that for upsells. Like we have one that's releasing, we have a masterclass November 29th, um, which will be releasing a new product. Right. And then from there, we'll roll that product release down through all of our offers. So we can promote upsells into each one as we roll the new one down and then it will be become a part of all of them. So we met, we manage our upsells that way. And that's kind of how we do it. But like there has to be a constant evolution of your product 
Um, and it helps to have like a core underlying methodology or point of difference that keeps you, uh, and then you have your core method or point of difference, and then you have your 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 product suite evolve with the times, but stay true to like, I guess, the core messaging of what you do. So there's some words and language that are being used here. And I know that most people listening to this are in the, you know, the B2B space, which means that a lot of people are in the service space. And Matt's using words like product. He's using the words like, uh, I think, did you use the word package? Um or a core methodology. One thing that I find is that there's a lot of people in B2B and they don't really have a tight offer. You go to them and they say, what are you going to do? Oh, we offer growth solutions or transformation services. Whereas if you met with someone like Matt, he would say, okay, what's your core method and what's the outcome that they're going to get? Because growth is nebulous. It's huge. Transformation is whatever. Yeah. If someone goes, I'm going to get this one outcome and it's bundled together in this particular way and there's a clear price point attached to that, that's a standout. Yeah. I think like, you know, from being in the back end of a lot of different sort of eight figure businesses that I'm running the sales for, like I can tell the offers that have legs mm. straight away, just go, Oh, that offer has got legs. Or I can usually go, this will be good for nine months. Mm. You know? So you, you can tell like, especially like hot offers, you know, like you get someone who's got a crypto offer and it's like, it's the, it's the perfect time for that method. But you know the method's going to die because it's inherent to the cycle, right? So, like, it will work for the people who do it during the time that it's 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 good, and then it will just go like that die. Um, same with like sort of biz ops are going through that at the moment. Like biz op, you know, like Kevin David just got done by the FTC again. Um, so uh, the big Amazon automation guy, right? So okay. like allegedly, I mean, it's on the FTC website. You can go read about it. Um, so like there's sort of a, a reckoning that's happening in the whole coaching consulting industry. And there's a big consolidation of like the shit guys are getting booted out and like the smaller guys are getting pummeled because like Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and TikTok are really, really prioritizing heavy spenders. Um, but then like the FTC is kind of cracking down on people who are spending heavy, but not able to produce results. So it's an interesting time at the moment when it comes to the whole sort of coaching or yeah industry. so there's a couple yeah. elements to this uh i'm old enough matt to actually say that i was working in the field of pr when y2k was a thing oh yeah and there were people that were like you know selling y2k packages really amazing selling y2k widgets that apparently you could stick in the side of your laptop and they'd fix it it was it was absolute scams 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 and con men and crazy and con women but the the message that I, I want to get across here is we can we can have a package we can have a product we can have a bundle we have a core method it needs to match the the target audience their headaches their obstacles their aspirations their desires must deliver an outcome but another element is that you can have a product or service which is hot right now but one that's evergreen like it's always going to be a problem with your target audience is probably going to last a little bit longer yeah, exactly. Like we teach people at seventh level how to get better at sales. Yeah. There's no end to that. No. You know? So it's like, um, and, and we you know we have testimonials from I think at the moment we have I want to say 9,200 testimonials. Um oh. uh and we have testimonials from every industry. So there's 158 industries according to like the magazines. Yep. Um, so we have testimonials from everyone. So let's um Let's talk about the NEPQ. The NEPQ yeah. Neuro Emotional Persuasion Questioning. It's the methodology that we have at seventh level of uh, like of how we teach people how to sell. Yeah. So spell that out again. NEPQ stands for Neuro Emotional Persuasion Questioning. Persuasion Questioning. Yeah. So a, a typical sales conversation in your world. How does it? How does it happen? How does it? Unfold? That's all phased out. So phase one is connection phase. So where we're kind of looking for an overarching goal and kind of put the focus off us and onto the prospect. Then we go into situation phase, which is where we want to find out what they're currently doing about the goal that they want to achieve. Uh, then from there, we move into problem awareness. So like, what are the key problems that are holding them back from being able to solve the problem to be able to actually get to the outcome? How long have they been happening? What's causing the problems and what kind of impacts is that problem having on them? Then from there, we move into solution awareness, which is where we get sort of a tangible outcome that we're looking for, what happens when they solve the problem, right? And then what kind of emotional uh, attachment we can get to the tangible, right? Uh, and then from there, like some criteria around what they're looking for and a few other things. Then we move into consequence questions. So consequences, like what happens if you don't? 
Uh, then we move into the commitment phase, which is where we get them to commit to ch- like like to the change. That's done slightly differently depending on what industry. Like so, there's all nuances around sort of different industries and stuff like that. Like if I'm teaching you how to sell windows, it's different than if I'm teaching you how to sell high ticket coaching. Like they're slightly different. Um, and then from there, we move into the presentation phase, and then it's you know objection handling and close. Um, what I like about this model um, is through that process, you can actually deliver outcomes during those first five or six steps. So if it's presented as a strategy or a consultation of sorts, you can actually answer questions and solve problems all throughout the journey, which is yeah. where to get the goal is really to be able to do like a 30 minute sales process. Yeah. For, for any offer you can sort of, once you get good at it, 25 minutes should be more than enough. Yeah. So I want to, uh, as I said, we began by talking about what doesn't work and now we're talking about what things that do work. Yeah. Um, what you've described to me is a framework rather than a script. Oh, no, we have scripts. I was about to say, does scripts have a role in your Yeah, business? scripts are essential for good, for being good at sales. And when I say good, I mean good, like good, good. Um, scripts are absolutely essential. Yeah. yeah. So if there's a 25-minute call, how much do you think, how much would that be scripted in your world? For me, 100%. Really? You would never know it, but it is. I could read off a script right now. You'd never know. Wow. My my pitch at the end of our sales training is, hey, what did you think of the process that I took you through today? Yeah, it was really good. Would it surprise you if I told you that was a script? And they go, really? Wow. And I go, yeah, do you want me to show it to you? Perfect. And then I bring the script up. Like that's the beginning of our presentation phase for selling seventh level. Yeah, uh, right. And we read, it's word for word. Like I would say 90 to 95% of it's scripted. Like there's obviously like deflections that you, we don't script the deflections, but they are pre-scripted deflections of how to get people back on track. But like good salespeople read from scripts. Um, like you, you just have to get them back onto script. The, how, how good a salesperson is, is how, like if you go to a movie, that's a hundred percent scripted, mm. right? Like that movie is scripted word for word. Um, and so the key with being good at sales is one, not sounding like you're reading from a script because it never should. And you can go onto my website right now, salesniper.net. You can download a free sales call. That thing was 100% scripted, right? Um, and then from there, getting them, knowing how to keep them on track, how to keep them on script and, and how to make the person feel heard without them realizing they're on a script. That's the whole trick of sales. Because like, if you can preordain the conversation, you'll win every time. Like you'll win. I had a 94% close rate of everyone that turned up for six months. Like, and the reason why I was able to do that is because like, I could keep them on script very efficiently. And so like, it's when you're, when you're on a script, you're playing chess against someone who doesn't even know they're playing chess. Yeah. Like it's, it's an, it's a totally unfair advantage, which is why you should close the majority of the time. Um, because you know the process. And even when it comes to objection handling, you can pre-script out your entire objection handling sequence, like word for word. What advice would you give to someone who's, say, like a solo or micro business owner, right? They don't necessarily have the resources to be able to, or, or, this, or the skill set to be able to script something on their own. To, you know, for example, I do webinars and, you know, I do podcasts too, but we've got evergreen webinars that are 90 minutes and they're 100% scripted. Once again, yeah. I don't sound like they're scripted, but you know what? It took me a long time to be able to get to a point where I knew what people are thinking at different points in a webinar. And I can yeah, ask a question and get all yeah. the responses that I want. And that's hard to do. Yeah. So someone that's like a solo or a micro business owner, they're listening to this and they're suddenly going, whoa, 25 to 30 minutes of script. Where would I get started? I mean, like, you know, I guess the nice answer is like, Go and download the free resources and do your best. But the real answer is like, you just have to do it. Like, um, it's an academic pursuit. And I think that people forget that. Like, if you were going to perform surgery on your mother in six months, like, you wouldn't just go to the lectures. Yeah. Right? And so, like, um, like, training is for a purpose. So, like, when I was in special operations training, you have to, like, blindfold it, put, 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 like, take apart and put together guns. Now, under no circumstances are you ever going to have to do that in real life, right? However, at some point, you will be getting shot at, your gun will fail, and you will have to look around, and you will have to, un, you will have to take apart your gun, fix it, put it back together without looking down. That's what that training was for. And so, like... 
when I was learning how, like when I was like, when I invested in sales training, I put $40,000 down. I had 50 grand in the bank and my business was doing like 10 grand a month. Right. As a sales rep, that's like, that's like what I was making, like 10, 15 grand a month, something like that. So I put 80% of my money down. Right. And I wasn't making that much money. And I was like, but I'm pretty confident that if I do everything this man says and I do everything perfectly and I study and I study and I study, then I'll be able to figure this out. And if he's making that much money, there's no reason why I can't make half. Yeah. Right. And so like I, but I took it very seriously. And so when he was taking me through my script and by mind you, I paid $40,000 for four sessions and access to Voxer. That's it. Mm. Right. So I got four sessions with him. And it was writing the script. And then from there, I just got to ask questions on Voxer. So what Which I did would was have been right for you because you've already got like, you know, you've already got your A plus skills and his A plus plus. And I mean, yes and no. I just like, I, I had never sold like that before. My selling style was very aggressive, very adversarial. Mm -hmm. That was my, and any PQ is the opposite. It's very leaned out. Mm. Um, it's like the opposite of you. That's why you don't get no shows. You never get hung up on. Like it's a very non-adversarial kind of very chill way of selling where you lean out a lot. Well, I was trying to think about before, like I'm always trying to like, go, how do we support like the solo or the micro business owners that, yeah. you know, and, and some, and a lot of people, as you know, are absolutely terrified when it comes to selling, you know, yeah. they, and, and they're like hanging, they're hanging on to like a, can secure for their clients and yeah. they're too afraid to tell their clients about it. I think, which is, I which think is like wrong. for me, it's always like, what's the worst that could happen? Like if someone says no to me, like who cares? Like that's honestly, that's honestly what I think. I, I don't care if someone says no to me because it's not like they're saying no to me. Like if you get cut off in a car, if someone cuts you off, do you think it's you they're cutting off? Yeah. Or are they just cutting off the car that you happen to be in? Mm -hmm. Like it's got nothing to do with you. Like it, I look at it the other way. And that is basically if someone's up, if I'm sitting in my little, and you've probably heard this analogy before, but if I'm sitting, sitting in my little canoe and there's raging waters around me and sharks and electric eels and somebody's flailing around in the water, I think it's my job to pass them an oar. And if they want to like bat that oar away, that's really up to them. Because at the end of the day, I know that if I've, I've got the right quality lead in my world that I'm having the conversation with, that they're going to, uh, they're going to be a good fit. Now we yeah. are going to have to wind up but I was trying to think about something for uh, some of the smaller organizations in our network and uh, who might not be able to pull together a script on their own, but you know what they will be able to do. And that is follow the structure of a basic framework. So yeah. even if you don't have a complete strict script, and, but you have a question that can dovetail into phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, phase five, that's an excellent place to start. Now I am absolutely certain that there are resources on your website yeah yeah there's a couple so you can go to seventh level hq.com and there's a bunch of like pure sales resources um i think we even have like a like an slo it's like 47 bucks or something and it's like a whole bundle of like all of our stuff put together like all of our ebooks and training and stuff i think we still got that going um slo and, stands for a self-liquidating offer guys yeah so apologies cheap product apologies, that yeah. is, is sold to offset the marketing yeah cost of marketing so, Yep. Um, so that's on our website. Or if you just like say any PQ into your phone, I'm sure at some point it'll pop up. Uh, the other one is salesniper.net. So we have a bunch of resources on sales management, SOPs and like bundles that you can get in order to kind of help optimize your sales call. Um, at, seven, at seventh level, we have sales training to sell. So if you want to buy that, that's great. But at sales sniper, we really have nothing to sell you. <laughs> so um, we can only work with like a very small number of businesses. Um, uh, so so yeah like if you want to go there you can download stuff and i think it'll ask for your phone number you almost definitely won't be called so apologies um i get told all the time it's very hard to reach us but um you know and then uh, you can follow me on like youtube and stuff like that it's just uh i think it's matt Ryder on youtube um and i do like weekly videos i have a podcast and we kind of talk all things sales sales process and uh what's happening yeah and uh i've been following matt on tiktok and that is because 59 seconds is about the amount of uh, amount of time I like to spend on a particular topic before I move on to the next one. That's speaking of, speaking that of seems time, seems to be the, the thing these days. It needs to be the thing. Uh, so speaking of time, uh, we have talked about sales strategies that uh, give you sales sales breath, and there were a few in there. But the 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 common theme was that anything that's disingenuous is probably going to bite you in the butt. If I think it so. Seems just a little bit hacky or a little yeah. bit tacky. 
or a little bit 1980s, yeah. it's probably going to get you in trouble. What is working are things like uh, being able to track your metrics, uh, knowing the sorts of things to track. But one of the things that you did mention very early is A-B testing, but not testing too many things simultaneously. Yeah, just test one thing at a time. If you test two, you won't know if one makes it go up and one makes it go down. Yeah. It's very and then we also talked about better offers. Uh, I believe when it comes to sales, I honestly believe that that there is the numero uno thing. A uh, good uh, offer is easy to sell, like to yeah. a point, to a point. Like, yeah. Um, but a bad, like a good offer, like a really solid offer, it makes the life of the salesperson much, much easier. Yeah. And that's yeah, not that's like, a- that doesn't mean us, like, that doesn't mean you stack it with shitloads of bonuses. That means like the offer genuinely solves a real problem. Yeah. Uh, and it's articulated that way. It, ex- it explains itself. You know, they go yeah. there, you answer the question, the unspoken question, usually what do I get or what's in it for me? And if you can say, here's what you get. And they go, that is something that I need and the price is right. And I can see how it's all going to add up. It's all going to be cool. Uh, and then finally, there was one more piece of advice or wisdom. And that is, that's right. So, uh, so Matt is saying uh, that uh, NEPQ, how many phases are in the NEPQ? Seven. Seven, Seven phases, phases to NEPQ, and it is indeed a framework, but Matt has said the superstars script it completely out, and I'll tell you what, guys and girls, I'm going to be jumping on his website, and I want to be listening to one of these calls, because that's how we learn. When it Pretty sure in the next that. masterclass that I'm going to sell someone live, so well, I've, I've, right. I've, 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 on the next masterclass, I'll be selling somebody live, um, and then, uh, yeah, like I've done, I've done that a few times. Tell me, so, sorry, tell, what you're on a masterclass, you, you sell do people a live phone call or something. What do you do? Yeah, just take a phone call, sell them live. If oh, right, and and then Jeremy will like commentate it while I do it, exactly what I'm doing and why. That's hilarious. That's awesome. Yeah, it's just a process. Like once you understand the process, like it's not, it's not that it's not rocket science because it's not easy to do, but like with proper preparation, planning, and practice, like you can get really good at it. And so, like, um, I can. I could like, I can predict what all my sales goals, all my sales guys will say, you know? Um, and I can predict how they'll say it because I'm not only in the script, you can insert tonality cues. Like, that's the brilliant part about it. Like you can insert skepticism or curiosity or empathy, you know? So you can start to cue that. And then when you teach that, like that's, cause that's what a script is. It's why like I've hired actors in the past and like, like out of work actors to be like SD setters and stuff like that, they pick up the scripting perfectly straight away because all you got to do is tell them the intent of the script. They can sit there and read it and go, okay. And they just like play the role of the sales guy. Yeah. You know, well, incidentally, it's, we've done exactly that. It works really well. With setters as well, too. Yeah. There's a cat, there's a character called Alex that, <laughs> does, that doesn't exist, but Alex is, Alex is our setter and Alex yeah. always sets whether someone else is playing Alex that day or not. All right, it's time to wind up. <laughs> Thanks so much, uh, Matt. This has been really terrific. Uh, really eye-opening on a number of different levels. I love hearing different perspectives, uh, particularly when it comes to something that's a little bit, um, I don't know, sometimes it feels a little bit black art like sales. Uh, any final words of wisdom before we go? Nah, well, good. Thanks for having me on. Nah, all good. Thanks for having me on. Thank you, Matt.